Yes. Can I start? Yes. Come. Okay. Okay. Meantime, I'm going to um, So, lecture number 11. Phase transitions. Okay, can you see the blackboard or you need to put the light? Yeah, Is it better? Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Um, good. So, Wednesday we start superconductivity and superconductivity is one of the examples of phase transition. So we need to have um, some tools and some theory in order to discuss a uh, phenomena which we are going to concentrate during um, next month. So first of all, let's start with examples of phase transition which we already uh, knew. Uh, let's be back to uh, the phenomena of water stem condensation. So B, C. Um, and we discussed uh, that below the sort of transition point, T node, um, we have a um, macroscopic number of particles uh, occupying uh, the lowest energy state. So a node is equal to N. 1 minus t over t node to the power of 3 half to the power of 3 so 3 half right doesn't matter actually doesn't matter what power uh, it is in the trap we have a t over t node to the power of 3 <coughs> so what do we learn from uh, this exercise first of all that there is something which is equal to zero for temperature t larger than t node. And there is something, in particular a node, which is non-zero below critical temperature t node. Um, so if we massage it a little bit, m to the power t node to the power 3 half minus t to the power 3 half over t node to the power 3 half, I will multiply uh, to uh, the sum so it will be n t node to the power 3 half minus t to the power 3 half uh, t node to the power 3 half plus t to the power 3 half divided by t node to the power 3 half t node 3 half plus t 3 half so I need actually identical um, operation multiplying numerator and numerator uh, by this guy so, um, and then, <coughs> everything what I am going to discuss today happens actually in the vicinity of a T node. So, without losing any generality, I can say that this is 2 T node to the power 3 half, and the numerator um, is equal to T node um, uh, cube um, minus uh, T cube. So, this is approximately a node T node cube minus T cube to the power 2 t node cube. Approximately because um, I replaced, here I consider that t um, is approximately equal to t node. I cannot do it here uh, because I'm interested in the difference. So basically it's a node t node minus t to the power times 3 t node uh, squared divided by 2 T node cube again approximately. So, which means that if I will characterize my uh, transition um, in terms of the quantity square root over a node, a node, so it behaves like that, and in the vicinity over T node, um, it is proportional to T node minus T over T node square root. So, again, in whatever I do today, I assume that t minus t node over t node modulus is much smaller than 1. 
This is the condition which I am going to use today. So we can introduce something which we will call order parameter. And the order parameter tells us that this order parameter is non-zero for temperature smaller than temperature of the transition and this is zero at the temperatures larger than temperature of the transition. So this example we already considered. <coughs> However, there are plenty, many other examples of phase transitions. For example, we can speak about magnets. This is what we are going to do at the end of the course. But you already met it in your practice. Suppose you have a magnetic piece of magnetic material, magnetic metal. And we know that the metal uh, remains magnetic until some temperature, for example, iron becomes magnetic, so it's, it is a magnet uh, for <coughs> temperatures below like 600 Kelvin, and um, it is completely non-magnetic, paramagnetic for temperatures above. So if we are talking about ferromagnets, then we can speak about magnetization um, as a function of temperature here. And it behaves in pretty same way. So for low temperatures, we have ordered magnet moments, spins or orbital moments. Um, and above, everything is disordered. So magnetization is non zero below T node and zero above. So we have a ferromagnetic state here and paramagnetic state there. We can think about metal insulator transition. Um, what are metals and what are insulators? From the point of view of band structure, for insulator we have completely filled band. Um, this is a conduction band and this is completely, this is valence band, sorry. And conduction band is completely empty. So there is a gap and because of this gap, in order to make this material conducting, you need to activate electrons above the gap. It costs energy. <coughs> and therefore, at very small temperatures, uh, the conduction band is empty, and therefore this material doesn't conduct current. And this is insulator. In contrast, metal um, has a conduction band which is partially filled and there is no gap. And in order to conduct current, you just activate electrons above uh, the Fermi surface and they perfectly conduct, so there is no activation gap. Um, in principle, you can study phenomena when the gap closes um, at some temperature, and therefore you have a transition from insulator uh, to metal. This is yet another example of uh, the phase transition. Um, and here, uh, example number two, we are talking about magnetization. Here we are talking about gap. And last but not least, something which we are going to discuss starting tomorrow is a superconductor. <coughs> In a superconductor, we have a pretty the same situation, namely at temperatures below something, uh, materials, material can conduct current without energy losses. And therefore, um, in very general way, um, we have superconductor to the left and normal conductor to the right. Um, this is temperature zero. And once again, we can introduce a para order parameter. And for example, here, as we will see it on Wednesday, the order parameter, which is superconducting gap, which is the same time the modulus of uh, the wave function. Uh, however, uh, we can consider whole wave function. Again, like in superfluidity, superconductors can be characterized by the global wave function, and we can consider um, this global wave function on the parameter, and therefore all these examples tell us that um, we have similarities, namely we have something which we call the order parameter, which is zero at temperatures above temperature of uh, transition and non-zero below, but what is different in these examples, we have a different number of components of the order parameter. For example, in the first example, order parameter is a scalar. 
here for magnets, since magnetization, microscopic quantity is a vector. The order parameter is vector. Um, scalar means it has one component. <coughs> vector, which means we have three components. Um, and if we are talking about wave function, wave function is a complex object, so it has a real and imaginary part, therefore the number of components is two components. Here for the gap, it's, it's pretty the same um, as um, uh, superconductor in some situations, but uh, the point is that we can imagine more different situations when all the parameter has more components. For example, in uh, signal electrics, the other parameter is four components, and so on and so forth. Um, so what we see uh, that in principle, a theory should also depend on the number of components um, of the other parameter. And we are going to uh, construct very simple theory, which describes uh, behavior of our other parameter um, uh, in non-trivial situation and the trivial situation, um, and we discuss what kind of um, conclusions we can draw uh, from um, this very simple, um, simple thing. Okay? If it is okay, with examples, let me now start to build in some simple, simple theory. Uh, you discussed with Andre on tutorial uh, some thermodynamics, um, and uh, today I am going to deal um, with the Gibbs potential following our convention. I will denote it as phi capital, and since it's a Gibbs free energy, its native variables are pressure and temperature. <coughs> So, um, we said that phi is connected to energy, so it's energy plus P dot V minus uh, P dot S. So, this is a pressure, this is volume, this is a temperature, and this is the entropy. Um, and, as I said, the variables are pressure and temperature. So, pressure actually tells us uh, the constant pressure, that the system is in mechanical equilibrium. If temperature is constant, it tells us that the system is in thermal equilibrium. And we are going to deal with a situation where pressure is constant and analyze what happens with uh, this uh, free energy, Gibbs free energy, at temperatures below T node and above T node. So I will consider two different situations. <coughs> so temperature is, of course, constant. Um, in um, all thermodynamic equilibrium situations, and I'm only dealing with thermodynamic situation. However, if I change temperature and each and every continuous point of line we have certain state, I will characterize free energy, Gibbs free energy, and consider uh, temperature dependence of it. And I will drop index Gibbs, Gibbs because all the time I'm going to deal with the Gibbs free energy. Okay, so what I'm going to discuss now is called Landau theorem. And what Landau suggests that in the vicinity of the phase transition point, um, the Gibbs free energy can be Taylor expand in terms of the other parameter. So, I will introduce the other parameter phi, and without losing generality, I will start considering single component, so one component or the parameter. Very simple situation. Um, tomorrow, well, not tomorrow, on Wednesday, we start dealing with superconductivity, and we will repeat um, the arguments in a more complicated way, considering two components of the parameter. And the next chapter, magnetism, we will see how it works for three component or the parameter. Okay? Can you hear me well? So, if I write Taylor expansion in the vicinity of the phase transition point, I will introduce parameter tau 
which is um, T minus TC. Now I will call it TC, TC. And as I said, I will assume that this dimensionless parameter tau is much smaller than 1. So without any losing generality, in the vicinity of um, the phase transition point, I can express my deep free energy as a constant plus some phi 1 times uh, phi plus phi 2 times phi square plus phi 3 times phi cube plus phi 4 times phi 4 and so on and so forth. So, now let's think about coefficients. I told you that these phases to the left and to the right are different by symmetry. In particular, in the moderates we have an ordered state, we have a disordered state. In the superconductors we have a gap and uh, we have no gap. For the condensate, we have a condensate or we have a no condensate. And since um, this situation corresponds to dif two different types of symmetry, without any losing of generality, I can say that the linear term doesn't exist. So, <coughs> for all possible situations, there is no linear term because we are going to deal with a minima of free energy. It's like um, with the oscillators. With the oscillators, you are dealing with a minimum of potential, therefore, the linear term in expansion of energy is um, absent. Well, then we are left with a, a quadratic term, cubic term, and quadratic term. Um, again, um, let's now um, look at a quadratic term. What we are saying that if I now plot the free energy, we are saying that Gibbs free energy as a function of order parameter um, at temperatures above critical temperature we should have stable minimum corresponding to zero order parameter. So we are saying that and we are also saying that below critical temperature we are expecting that at temperatures below TC we should have another stable minimum you see that this is zero uh, phi minus phi node phi minus phi node this is zero corresponding to non-trivial order parameter so the previous stable minimum uh, should be replaced by a uh, new stable minimum and previous stable minimum becomes unstable maximum. So this is zero. This is phi naught minus phi naught. So we are saying that phi two, phi two at t equal to tc should be equal to zero because it changes sign and it is positive. Phi two is positive um, um, at temperatures um, above tc and phi two is negative. Um, at temperatures below TC. So without any losing of generality, we can write that phi 2 is equal to 1 half A tau, where tau is T minus TC over TC, and times volume, because we are dealing <coughs> with extensive quantities. What about phi 3? Um, phi 3 is a bit more complicated. If I'm talking about the same class of universality which I started to do, namely all examples which I presented are related to the second order phase transition, um, where, as you see, phi 3 is equal to 0, because all odd components are 0. However, in principle, it is not necessary. Let me remind you of the example of the first of the phase transition P V suppose we have transition between liquid and vapor liquid and gas and this is standard Van der Waals isotherm so this is the pressure against volume T is constant 
If the pressure is low, we have a gas. If the pressure is high, we have a liquid. However, you see, and you know it from the course of statistical mechanics, I hope that in this curve we have a region of uh, thermodynamic instability. This is what I put as a dot line, because dp over dv, compressibility here, um, minus dp over dv, um, is negative. And um, negative compressibility means that this state cannot be realized. Therefore, when you go along this isotherm, basically you go this way this way, and then you go down. So the transition from liquid to gas um, occurs um, not in a continuous way, uh, but in the way you still have the order parameter, but the order parameter doesn't change continuously, it drops as a function of, say, some variable, for example, pressure. Okay, um, so for uh, high pressure you have a liquid, for low pressure um, you have uh, gas. You can start with a low pressure situation, apply some pressure, and system will collapse into the gas. This is an example of the first order phase transition, where phi 3 is not equal to zero, but as I said, we, we have a discontinuity, and physics of the first order phase transition, although it's very interesting, it's different from the physics of second order transition, which I'm going to discuss um, in the remaining part of uh, the uh, lecture. What is different? In the second order phase transition, as we see it in a uh, BEC situation, the order appears homogene homogeneously in the whole system. So you have a symmetry breaking, we discussed it with the Bose gas, you have a spontaneous symmetry breaking, and the phase appears in whole volume. For the first order phase transition, it's different. So you have islands of a new phase in in, in, inside the old phase. Like when you condense um, uh, gas in the liquid, there are some droplets of liquid which are called nucleus or center of nucleation. So you have an homogeneous situation and eventually when you apply more and more pressure, uh, the system, whole system becomes liquid. But the new phase appears not in the whole volume, but as a center of nucleation. Um, so without losing generality, I will also assume that for Landau second order phase transition, phi 1 is 0 and phi 3 is 0. Um, moreover, um, I am going to discuss stable phases. This is why I plotted this parabola. Um, with the branches going up, it provides us stability of the system, so I will assume, without losing generality, that phi 4 is positive, in order to provide the stability of the system. Okay, so I can define phi 2 um, in terms of coefficient a, and the key point is that phi 2 changes sign at the transition point, and I will redefine phi 4 as one fourth B volume. Um, good. So by collecting everything, um, as example of first order phase transition, I presented liquid gas or liquid vapor, and also crystallization, uh, which you probably see with this cold weather now, is also first order phase transition. Because when you see ice on the small um, um, spots of the water, you also see that ice doesn't appear in the whole surface. It first starts to appear in spots, in patches, and then it grows and covers whole water. So the liquid crystal transition is yet another example of the first order phase transition. And there, by the way, the coefficient phi 3 in a similar expansion is not equal to zero. While coefficient phi 1 is always equal to zero. Good. Let me now recollect everything what I wrote now and write down the Gibbs free energy in this way. With the new coefficients a and b, <coughs> the coefficient phi 4 uh, doesn't change its sign. Um, so I'm saying that phi is equal to phi naught plus one-half a tau volume phi square 
plus one fourth b volume phi to the fourth. Okay. Good. So let's now consider uh, these two situations when we have two stable mean. Since I'm looking um, <coughs> for the minimum, I will differentiate phi d phi with respect to the order parameter. And to find the minimum, I need to request um, that this derivative is equal to zero. So if I do that, I see that a tau volume phi plus b volume phi cube is equal to zero. Um, I will divide by the volume. Volume is always present because I'm dealing with thermodynamic potentials and thermodynamic potentials are extensive uh, quantities. Quantity, I have equation phi a tau plus b phi square is equal to zero. So, if now tau is positive, tau is positive, which means the temperature is bigger than Tc, I have only one solution of this equation. Remember that phi is real field. Only one solution, which is trivial. Phi equal to zero. And if I plug in phi equal to zero, then minimum phi minimum is equal to phi naught. However, the situation changes dramatically if tau is negative or temperature then smaller than Tc. I still have minimum, I still have extremum corresponding to phi equal to zero, but in addition I have phi naught which is equal to um, a modulus tau over b to the power one half. And therefore, it happens what I already plotted once. This is phi minus phi naught. Phi temperature is larger than you see. Let's compute what the energy is. Phi uh, T is equal to phi naught minus one half A modulus tau um, times phi naught square, which is A modulus tau over B and volume. I just plug in phi naught here. Um, and the second term is plus one half B volume A modulus tau over B square. If you collect this is one fourth, sorry. If you collect all terms, you will get that phi, phi naught minus phi naught is equal to minus one fourth A modulus tau square over B times volume. So the previous minimum zero, phi minus phi naught becomes maximum and you have phi naught minus phi naught, mu minima, and this is minus one fourth a tau square over b times volume. So we get two mu minima, and in principle um, the system needs to decide to which minimum to go, and this is done by small perturbation, so if your system sits here, so you go either to this minima or to that minima. Um, and um, if you want to have an illustration, this is like uh, with the magnets, which you magnetize, you apply infinitely in a small magnetic field, then the system chooses direction, and then it goes either to left or to right maximum. And um, the point is that we are dealing with a classical system. Um, the coefficient is proportional to volume and proportional to number of particles, therefore there is nothing about quantumness in the system, there is no way to tunnel from one minimum to another in the thermodynamic limit because uh, the um, uh, height of the barrier, the height of the barrier 
if proportional to the volume of uh, the system. So if we occur either in the right or in the left maximum, the system remains staying in this uh, uh, mean of the free energy. Sorry. So we already captured some uh, key properties on, of uh, the phase transition and let's now uh, discuss two other things, namely in the next few minutes I'm going to discuss what happens with the entropy and specific heat um, at the phase transition point and I'm going to be introduce critical exponents which characterize behavior of certain quantities at the vicinity of the phase transition point. This is the logic. Question, did you have this theory in the course of statistical mechanics? Uh, we discussed uh, of, um, second order phase transition, uh, but uh, we didn't uh, talk about other parameters. So you didn't do this Landau theory where the free energy is a function of the other parameter, or you did? Uh, no, we didn't. Okay. Um, since I need it very much for the remaining part of my course, I will keep doing what I plan to do, and I will finish this lecture with considering the fluctuations. Um, okay, good. Now, the entropy. So, all what I'm saying so far is related to Landau theory of a second order phase transition. Um, and in Landau theory, your free energy is function of the order parameter and the assumption was that the, this function is analytic in the vicinity of phase transition point. It doesn't have any singularity and as a result it can be Taylor expanded. <coughs> what we will see in the uh, lecture, start to see in the lecture Wednesday, um, will be Ginsburg Landau theory which is generalization of Landau theory and the difference will be that the free energy will be a functional of the order parameter. We will see already today what does it mean being functional when we consider fluctuations. So entropy. Sorry, I need to rush to go a little bit quicker because first of all I assume that you know something of that. And second, we were late by beginning lecture by uh, 10 minutes. Okay, entropy is minus d5 over dt. Um, <coughs> and I'm going to consider um, this um, uh, entropy on the line of uh, the or the parameter. I already defined uh, the line, which means um, that um, it's minus d5 over d5. On the line means um, that free energy depends on temperature through the coefficients and through the order parameter uh, times d5 over uh, dt, and on the line means that I am already sitting around on this curve, around minima, so this is zero. This is condition which I already used. Uh, minus d phi over dt at phi equal to constant. Okay, so what remains to see is a dependence on phi uh, through their coefficients. So, phi is equal to phi naught plus one half a tau v phi square plus one fourth b v phi to the four. And I stop here. So this coefficient depend on t because tau is written there. So the entropy can be written down as a sub constant as node, since I have a sign minus and um, 
tau is uh, here, so this is minus one half a uh, phi square a volume phi square over Tc. So I differentiate tau with respect to temperature and I have one over Tc. And the, this term is considered to be temperature independent. Okay, this is the entropy. So, it is equal to S node. Um, now, if I am above the critical temperature, then this is just S node and nothing else, because phi square is equal to zero. By the way, since I am on the line, I put phi node square. If somehow I am below, critical temperature, this is S node minus one half A V. Phi node square is equal to A modulus tau divided by B. Um, and since I assume that below critical temperature tau is negative, so this is S node plus um, A square tau over 2b times volume. This is for uh, temperatures below critical temperature. Right? So, what I see is that the entropy is continuous at the phase transition point. Because if tau is equal to zero, it's a snow from here, and this is a snow from there. So, entropy is continuous at the phase transition point. Um, let me now compute C, and since I'm dealing with a Gibbs free energy, um, I compute it at constant pressure. Remember that my variables are pressure and the, temp and the temperature, so Cp is um, T dS over dT. Um, if I am um, below critical temperature, I have S, I have some um, C node plus, I differentiate it with respect uh, to uh, the temperature, I get Tc, here I have a Tc as well, so this is A square volume over 2B, so this is temperature larger than Tc, and I have some constant C node if temperature is smaller than Tc. So what I have here, let me just plot the curve, this is Cp, that other way around, sorry, um, that if I go from ordered phase, so here I have ordered, here I have a disorder that the specific heat has jumped at the phase transition point and the value of this jump I will need it at the end of this lecture is A square V over 2B defined from the point of uh, view um, Sorry, ds over dt, what is wrong? Aha, uh -huh. what is wrong here? That I forgot to write this here. Here, I forgot to write the tc here. You see, I have Tc here, and therefore I have a Tc here, and I have a Tc here. So let me put it above the title, the delta C, P, the jump is equal to A square volume divided by 2 B Tc. So, A and B are some phenomenological coefficients in Taylor expansion depending on your concrete realization of the phase transition. But so far, I consider this A and B just as constant. 
So, we see that for the second order phase transition, the specific heat, which is the second derivative of the thermodynamic potential with respect to temperature, acquires a jump. So, this is basically why we are saying this is the second order phase transition. For the first order phase transition, <coughs> the specific heat itself will diverge at the phase transition point. Why it diverges? Recall how you boil the water in your um, teapot in the morning. So what you do, the water reaches the boiling temperature, 100 Celsius, and you put extra heat to the system. Um, but the temperature doesn't change. The water remains to be at 100 Kelvin. So therefore, D energy um, over D temperature, which is specific heat, is equal to infinity. Uh, and therefore, the entropy will acquire a jump. For the second order phase transition, the entropy is continuous, specific heat acquires jump. For the first order phase transition, the entropy, which is <coughs> the, specific, uh, the first derivative of thermodynamic potential, acquires jump, and the specific heat diverges. Therefore, if we consider uh, the derivative, corresponding derivative of thermodynamic potential, with respect to some variable, temperature, pressure, or whatever, um, then, depending on the derivative, first, second, third, and so on and so forth, you can correspond to order of the phase transition. For the um, first order phase transition, the first derivative has jumped. For the second order phase transition, the second derivative has jumped. For the third order phase transition, the third derivative has jumped. And the problem which I gave you is to show that uh, BEC transition is the third order phase transition, namely the derivative of specific heat will have a jump. Okay? Good. So we learned yet another important thing that the specific heat for the second order transition requires a jump. Good. Now, critical exponents. And you see that I did almost nothing. I just postulated how the free energy, being analytic function of the order parameter, behaves in the vicinity of the phase transition point. So, critical exponents. We already learned that the order parameter phi node, which is A modulus tau over B, to the power of one half, if we plot the order parameter as a function of temperature in the vicinity of T node, we see that it behaves as square root over tau, which is square root over Tc minus T over Tc. This is a Tc. So, we can introduce the first critical index, which characterizes us how phi is proportional to modulus tau to the power beta. So, how the order parameter behaves in the vicinity of the phase transition point. So, for Landau theory, for Landau theory, we already see that the index beta is equal to 1 half. This is the first critical index which we introduce, which characterizes the behavior of the order parameter. Here it's phi <coughs> in the vicinity of the phase transition point. Let's introduce the external field, like magnetic field, into the system. If you want illustration, consider magnets, you apply magnetic field, and in principle we know in paramagnets uh, the magnetization is induced and being proportional to the field. So, in the external field, magnetization is not equal to zero at any temperature. In order to add the field, one half a tau volume phi square plus one fourth b volume phi to the four, I will add this linear term um, uh, 
with respect to all the parameter, which guarantees me having non trivial solution at any temperature. HV times phi. And this is a linear response um, theory, which tells us that magnetic field is linear cu coupled to the order parameter. Let me do the same uh, trick and therefore calculate d phi, d phi over d phi. So, and put it equal to zero. This is a condition of uh, having extreme. So I have a tau v phi plus b v phi cube is equal to h volume. So I took a derivative and I put this term which I deliberately put with a sign minus to the right hand side. Okay, this is a condition of extremum of the potential. Now, if I assume that I am at the critical point, T equal to Tc, therefore tau equal to zero, I have now solution of the equation, cancel volume, that phi is equal to H over B to the power one third. This is a condition for extreme. Now, this equation describes me behavior of the order parameter over magnetic, as a function of a magnetic field. I can introduce the index, critical index, h to the power 1 over delta. Historically, it happens like this. And for the data theory, from this equation, I see that critical index delta is equal to 3. This is yet another critical index which characterizes me how the order parameter depends on external, not necessarily magnetic field applied uh, to the system. Three. Let's consider susceptibility. So, chi, again, I am appealing to what we have discussed for the paramagnets in the magnetic field. Um, uh, the susceptibility is defined over dH in the limit H goes to zero. So this is the way we define susceptibility in paramagnetic state of a free um, electron gas. So if I take this equation and apply uh, the derivative, what I see that d phi over dh, I open the bracket, a tau, this is from this term. When I differentiate this term, I have 3, 3 b v phi square, dh, d phi over dh, and derivative of the right hand side gives me 1. So therefore, susceptibility, chi, which is d phi over dh is equal to 1 divided by a tau plus 3 b, volume is absent, phi square. Okay, so we see that susceptibility is equal to 1 over a tau if temperature is larger than Tc, then phi is equal to 0. However, if temperature is smaller than Tc, I have a phi mode, which I'm going to plug in, and I use the fact that tau is negative below Tc. So as a result, I have a minus 1 plus 3, therefore I have a 2A modulus tau. You see that susceptibility diverges at the critical point. We will see it when we discuss local magnets. And it is proportional, inversely proportional to the tau. However, there is a coefficient 2 in front of the behavior, which is characteristic, again, characteristic for Landau theory of phase transition. What I am saying that I introduce a critical index, saying that susceptibility is proportional to modulus tau to the power minus gamma. And for Landau theory of phase transition, Landau theory, Gamma is equal to 1. From here, you see it clearly.
Okay? Last but not least, I would like to introduce the critical index alpha. Can you see it in this part? Uh, or the microphone uh, actually make an obstacle? Okay. Um, last but not least, I am introducing critical index saying that specific heat, say CP, is proportional to modulus tau to power minus alpha. However, we see that for the first, for the second order phase transition, and now I'm talking about second order phase transition, specific heat doesn't diverge. Therefore, index alpha in Landau theory, alpha is equal to zero. So let me summarize. We introduce four critical exponents, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, characterizing the behavior of order parameter as a function of temperature, as an order parameter, as a function of applied field, uh, the susceptibility as a function of temperature, and specific heat as a function of temperature. And we concluded that in Landau theory, alpha is equal to zero, beta is equal to one half, gamma is equal to one, and delta is equal to three. These are critical exponents. <coughs> and these critical exponents characterize the universality class. You see that this critical exponent doesn't depend on anything. It's just powers of corresponding dependence of the um, corresponding parameter. So these critical exponents characterize the universality class of the phase transition. Good. So in the remaining part of uh, the uh, lecture, I will consider the fluctuations and find the criteria. I said that my description is valid when the parameter tau is much smaller than one. But in the remaining part of the lecture, I'm going to identify the lower bound of tau. Because as I show you, the fluctuations start to grow in the vicinity of the phase transition point and as a result, the validity of the theory, which I'm presenting, um, is limited, and I'm going to find the lower bound of the theory, and in order to do it, I need to consider fluctuations in the system. I will write down the Gaussian theory of fluctuations. I will compute the correction to specific heat during, due to fluctuations. I will request that the correction to the specific heat is smaller compared to the jump, and therefore, I will find the lower bound for tau. This is the goal for remaining part of the lecture. Uh, professor? Yes? Uh, can you repeat a bit about uh, the thing you mentioned about the, uh, the characterizing unit, the same unit as the class of these transitions? Well, you will see that for Landau theory of phase transition, actually, and we will see it on Wednesday, uh, the critical exponents do not depend on anything, including the number of components of the order parameter. It just characterizes you, um, uh, the universal, so to say, for Landau theory of phase transition. So, if you are doing mean field, and we are going to do mean field both for superconductivity and magnetism, you will see that any mean field leads to this critical exponent regardless of the dimension of the system, regardless of the number of components of the order parameter. This is characteristic for the phase transition. We will see, however, that in experiments you see the strong deviation sometimes from this critical exponent. And in many cases this is indication that your criterion is violated. And therefore you have completely different theory, which um, is called um, theory of scaling, for example, uh, index gamma will be equal to 4 third. Uh, you will introduce two other indexes for correlation length. We will do it for so-called for anomalous dimension. Some of these indexes will depend on dimensionality of your system. Uh, you will see and um, what is upper critical dimension uh, and what is lower critical dimension. Um, uh, so I will probably ask Andre to have a tutorial about phase transition because this is the most general theory which 
thing. I almost have no assumptions. And moreover, this theory is not that old. Uh, the scaling theory was created at the end of 60s of 20th century. So it's roughly 50 years old and it continues to develop. There are quantum phase transitions where you don't have thermal fluctuations, but you have uncertainty principle. But as I said, as long as the class of universality of transition is concerned, these critical in indexes do complete information about um, uh, the universality class, and moreover, scalar theory tells us that these critical exponents are connected into some uh, equations. So they are dependent. So there are equations which connect different critical exponents. In principle, three years ago we had a separate course um, about uh, phase transition theory, which was given by Professor uh, Mercy Sun. It consists of like 10 uh, to 12 uh, lectures. You see that the topic um, is not what something which I can um, compress in one or two lectures, so it really deserves of knowledge of some quantum field theory methods, uh, because I'm talking basically about um, uh, application of some quantum field theoretical method to the situation with spontaneous symmetry breaking. Uh, however, um, this crash course uh, will be complemented um, with the gilbert landau theory, and I'm going to spend uh, two more lectures on uh, the landau gilbert landau theory, and I'm going to spend one or two lectures on theory of magnetism, which will also touch uh, uh, various aspects of the phase transition theory. So in, the, in, in reality, you will have almost five lectures about closely related to the phase transition theory and covering different aspects of it. Good, fluctuations. I did a mistake or what? Look to Asians. Okay. Let's consider so called coarse graining. We have some volume and microscopic volume, and we have some another part of this volume inside. So this is V and this is V node, and I will consider this small um, volume which I dashed um, as sitting in the environment of uh, V node. So I will write down the fluctuations of energy delta. So. The fluctuations, the total fluctuations, consists of the fluctuation delta E inside my volume V plus fluctuation of the environment. So this is environment. Change of the energy, if you like. I will come to the word fluctuations uh, later. So, since I am talking about energy and um, d energy, infinitesimal change of the energy is minus p dv plus p ds. This is what you discussed with Andre. For energy, uh, the variables are volume and entropy. So I can write it down if I consider the change of energy of the environment and I keep change of the energy in the volume intact so this is delta E change of the energy in given volume minus P delta V node plus T delta S node so this all is delta E node however since I have a closed system being in equilibrium, I can write down that delta V is equal to delta V plus delta V node is equal to zero. 
So the total volume doesn't change. If I have a change of the load, I have corresponding change of the volume. V and of course entropy doesn't change. Plus delta S node is equal to zero. This is condition that I have a closed system. So if I plug in delta V node is equal to minus delta V and delta S node is equal to minus delta F, I have a delta E plus P V and <coughs> I told you that I considered system in mechanical and thermodynamical equilibrium, namely pressure and temperature are constant, minus T S and this is nothing but Gibbs free energy. So the total change of the energy in the system, I put index total, is equal to change of the Gibbs free energy. Okay. I will consider the situation when my order parameter changes as a function of coordinate around some constant value of, of the or the parameter given by Landau Landau theory. So this is phi. So I will allow my order parameter to change a little bit from point to point in my sample. So the change of the order parameter will result in a fluctuation of energy. I will consider Gaussian theory, namely I will take into account only quadratic terms um, in the order parameter, which in the Gaussian theory will allow to say me that all changes, all fluctuations are independent. Because only in Gaussian theory you can say that. If um, a theory is not Gaussian, it contains higher uh, orders um, in phi, uh, then I am not allowed to uh, tell it um, anymore. So, in this situation, I will assume, having said that the order parameter uh, depends on the coordinate, that phi, my Gibbs free energy, and this is the reason why I'm dealing with Gibbs free energy, um, is not a function, but a functional of the order parameter. This is integral over dr. And I'm allowing the fluctuations C delta phi square. I will write coefficient one half plus one half a tau phi square plus one fourth b phi to the four. So, what is the difference between uh, Landau theory and theory of fluctuations which I'm presenting now? Um, in Landau theory, the integral over dr gives me volume of the system, and this is a volume which I kept in all equations. Now, since phi depends on r, I replaced the R-independent theory by R-dependent theory, and therefore I'm taking the integral um, over, and you see that the free energy is not just a function of order parameter, but it depends on the order parameter in the form of integral, so the order parameter is itself function of the coordinate, and therefore this is called functional fun T or now. I'm going to deal with this functional for simple scalar one component or the parameter, but on Wednesday we start to consider Gibbs-Bock Landau theory, which will be the functional theory of uh, the uh, two component or the parameter, and we will learn how to take functional derivatives. So we need to find a new criterion, because in theory expansion we just requested that the derivative of the free energy with respect to phi is equal to zero, and this was function derivative. On Wednesday, we learn how to make a variation, how to find the functional derivative, and we will find the new equations, which basically replace the simple equations which I discussed in the first part of uh, the lecture. And what I said here, 
in this picture. I said that phi is a function of r, can be written as phi mode, which is subject to Landau theory and which doesn't depend on r. This is this um, constant, plus some phi tilde as a function of r, I am allowing only small deviations of the order parameter from the point to point in my volume, and the validity I assume that phi tilde um, is much smaller compared to phi naught. This is the limit of small, small fluctuations. So now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to write down Fourier transform to rewrite um, uh, this uh, functional in the uh, K space. And I assume that different harmonics, different Ks, do not um, talk to each other. This is Gaussian theory. Think about it as oscillators. Um, and if I replace my system by non-interacting harmonic oscillators, I can think about the modes as non-interacting mode and proceed uh, with a summation uh, over all possible modes. But this is only for the situation when you don't have any non-linearity or the theory is Gaussian. Good. So if you will have a feeling that you don't understand everything, please don't worry. Most of the arguments which I am giving now will be repeated several times in the course and you will take it more easy after several times repetition. So, I will write down that phi tilde, or let me write phi, um, is 1 over square root of volume sum over k, um, phi k, e to the power i k r. Well, if I write, remember, I'm talking about single component, scalar or the parameter. So my field phi is real. So if I write complex conjugated variable, it will be 1 over square root of volume, sum over k, phi k star, e to the power minus i k r. I just made a complex conjugated. But since my field phi is real, in this sum I can replace in the summation k to minus k. So this is phi k minus k star e to the power i k r. So I just replace in the summation k to minus k. And what I see from the fact that my other parameter is real is phi minus k star is equal to phi k. This is connection between Fourier components. Moreover, uh, the k independent, if k is equal to zero, then I have R independent term, which is phi naught. So phi naught is included in this Fourier transform. So this is phi naught plus sum of k not equal to zero phi k i k r. So phi naught is already included. So this are uh, fluctuation of what I call phi tilde. Okay? Good. Uh -huh. I have terms gradient phi. So first of all, as I said, phi is equal to phi node plus phi tilde. Therefore, phi square is equal to phi node plus phi tilde. Square is equal to phi node square plus 2 phi node phi tilde. Plus phi tilde square. Phi to the 4 is equal to phi node plus phi tilde 4. I'm just talking about this term and this term. And I'm going to linearize it from the point of view of fluctuations. And keep, see some condition for linearized term and only keep terms up to phi tilde square, which actually gives me Gaussian theory of fluctuations. 
So this is phi node to the 4 plus 4 phi node cube phi tilde plus 6 phi node square phi tilde square plus so phi minus k star is equal to phi t plus 4 times phi node phi tilde cube plus phi tilde to the 4. So now we turn gradient phi square. Um, of course, I see that only phi tilde depends on r. Therefore, this is gradient phi tilde times gradient phi tilde. So I apply Fourier. This is 1 over volume, sum over k1 um, phi k1 e to the power i k1 r times gradient gradient sum over k2 phi k2 e to the power i k2 r so in this term I will use this connection um, replace k to minus k um, and apply uh, this identity so it means and then I apply derivative, so operator Madlock, of course, acts only on the exponent. So this is 1 over volume, sum over k1, k2. I have, first of all, phi k1. Then I have um, phi k2 star. I have k1, k2, times e to the power i, k1 minus k2, r. So this is the term of this gradient, but when I have integration over R, the integral of exponent gives me chronicle symbol. So the integral over dr e to the power i k1 minus k2 r will give me volume times delta k1 k2. So let me remember this. <coughs> so um, the same way. Um, phi square term will be uh, translated, I do the same sort of Fourier, uh, to the 1 over volume sum over k1, k2, phi k1, phi k2 star, uh, e to the power i, k1 minus k2. Um, so, when I do this, let's consider uh, terms linear with respect to phi tilde. Maybe this one. If I collect linear terms, I have phi tilde. Um, I have one half a tau times two plus um, one fourth b times phi cube node cube um, times 4 and you see that from the landau gilbrook theory this bracket is equal to 0 therefore when I expand in terms of the small fluctuations of the order parameter I will drop linear terms because they cancel out because of condition for Landau theory for phi node and I drop terms higher than cubic and fourth power because I'm going to consider the fluctuations being small remember that I said that phi tilde is much smaller than phi node therefore I only keep quadratic terms good as I said we repeat it because this is equivalent to taking some functional derivatives, we repeat it on Wednesday in a very detailed way. So, what I think is that um, my delta phi gives is equal to, and delta phi um, is accumulate phi node. So this is phi minus phi node under condition that uh, 
phi tilde is much smaller than phi naught, it can be written down as sum over k of the following c k square. c k square comes from the gradient term um, plus a tau plus 3 phi naught cube. 3 phi naught comes from the 6 in the uh, Newton binomial formula phi k phi k star. So this is phi k model square. And since I use this identity coming out from the fact that my order parameter is real, summation over k is done on half sphere. Because my Fourier components are not independent, are uh, being constrained by the condition that order parameter is real. Okay, so then the fluctuational part, fluctuation correction to the free energy is just, according to Gibbs distribution, is minus t logarithm sum over all fluctuations e to the power minus delta fluctuational over temperature. I use Gibbs ensemble and Gibbs distribution. And in according to what I said, this is minus temperature. K Boltzmann constant is considered to be equal to 1. This is a logarithm of a product of all K. As I said, my fluctuations are independent and exponent to the power sum is equal to product of exponents. Um, and I have an integral um, over e to the power minus ck squared plus a tau plus 3 phi naught 3b 3b phi naught squared times phi k modulus squared over temperature. So I'm integrating over all fluctuations. The real part and the imaginary part are independent of the harmonics. So this is d real part of a phi k, d imaginary part of a phi k. So the logarithm of product is given is equal to sum of the logarithm. So k belongs to half sphere. So what I have, I have minus t, I have a sum over k uh, belongs to the half sphere, and this is a logarithm. And you see, as I said, um, I am in Fourier space, um, I consider real part of my Fourier harmonic and imaginary part are two independent points, but I can uh, come from the Cartesian coordinate system to the polar polar coordinate system, this will be phi k modulus square d modulus phi k um, times d theta. So this is the same element of the volume written in Cartesian in Cartesian and polar coordinate system. Uh, sum over k, I have a logarithm of the integral. Now modulus of the other parameter changes from 0 to infinity. Nothing depends on the face of the order parameter because exponent contains phi k modulus square. So I have a 2 pi e to the power minus c k square plus a tau plus 3 b phi node square times phi k modulus square phi k modulus d phi k modulus. So I can take this integral. The integral from exponent is very simple. Um, as a result, I have minus t logarithm sum over k belonging to half sphere logarithm over pi t divided by c k square plus a tau plus 3 b phi naught square. So I computed 
<coughs> correction of a free energy due to fluctuation, variation of my order parameter which changes slowly from point to point of my real space. Now, the job is almost done. I'm sorry, I need maybe two, three more minutes. We started ten minutes later. I apologize for that. So the last step is to compute the correction to specific heat. I will keep the last line. So, C fluctuations, and I'm talking about Cp, of course. This is minus T, D2 phi fluctuation over D T squared. <coughs> T, temperature, you see it here, is a function of tau. So instead of differentiating with respect to um, temperature, I will rather differentiate with respect to tau. With a simple uh, substitution, I can write down that this is minus 1 over Tc, d2 phi fluctuation of d tau square. You can easily get it. And if I now apply, so this is phi fluctuation to uh, this, what I get is um, that it is equal to minus a, uh, so plus a squared, a squared, sum of k belongs to half sphere, I differentiate this function twice, um, with respect to tau, um, and I have um, sum over k, and this is 1 over c k squared plus a tau plus 3 b phi naught squared squared. Of course, first derivative of the logarithm gives me first power, one of the argument, and second derivative gives me square. So now, as usual, I replace summation of my independent modes by the integral, but in this integral I use the fact that I am integrating over half sphere. Therefore, the solid angle will not be equal to 4 pi, but just 2 pi. So this is a square integral over d k square dk over 2 pi square. And what remains, uh, volume, and what remains is this a tau plus, sorry, ck square, plus a tau plus 3b final square square and from 0 to infinity. This integral can be easily calculated um, with using contour integration. I give you just an answer. I don't have time to uh, calculate this integral on the blackboard. So the final answer is volume a square divided by 16 pi c 3 half times 1 over a tau plus 3 b phi naught square to the power 1 half. So the fluctuation correction to the specific heat actually diverges as 1 over tau 1 over square root of tau. So, in order to define the validity of Landau theory, we need to request that this divergent fluctuation, namely delta C fluctuation, should be much smaller than the jump, which is A square volume divided by 2 by B T C. If I plug in, and I use the fact that if I am above phase transition point, then phi naught square is equal to zero, so this is one of the square root of tau. If I am below phase transition point, this is minus uh, a tau, this is three a tau, so this is again factor of two, but in both sides, fluctuational correction diverges is one of the square root. From this condition, I will find the tau 
from one hand should be smaller than one, from another hand it should be smaller, is larger than some number, and this number is called the Gilbert number. You can do this exercise yourself. And this Gilbert number is b squared tc divided by a c cube. You see that from parameters of my theory, and parameters are a, b, and c, and also critical temperature, um, I construct the dimensionless number, which is called the Gilbert number. If this condition is satisfied, I'm fine to use Landau or Gilbert Landau theory. If somehow I approach closer to the phase transition point, the fluctuations become so strong that this Landau theory is not valid and I need to do something else. Now, what is typical value of Ginsburg number for phase transitions which we are going to discuss? For the superconductors, um, conventional superconductors, this Ginsburg number is of the order of 10 to the power minus 12, which means that you physically cannot approach to the critical temperature that close uh, that you will feel fluctuations in ordinary conventional superconductors. So Landau and Ginsburg Landau theory will be perfect theory uh, describing the phase transition superconducting system. For typical magnetic systems, the Ginsburg number is of the order of 0.1, which means that there is a way to approach the critical temperature where you will see strong deviations from the Landau theory, and then you can test the scaling theory prediction. For liquid helium-4, the Ginsburg number estimated from the point of view of phenomenological constants appears to be larger than 1. Therefore, this inequality can never be fulfilled. If Ginsburg number is larger than 1, you cannot simultaneously request that the tau is from the same point is much smaller than 1 and much larger than 1. And therefore, uh, this phase transition theory in application to superfluid helium can never be applied. So one needs to do something else. Um, and um, this is not described by <coughs> the Landau theory of uh, phase uh, transition. Okay, what I suggest that you go along the line of the calculations which I uh, sketch um, in my uh, lecture. Um, I dropped all coefficients of the order of 1, all coefficients like pi, 4 pi, or whatever, uh, only contain um, the variables, uh, not variables, constants given by the phenomenological theory, but I strongly suggest that um, you repeat, um, repeat it um, again. Um, that's all. I promise to you that I will give sort of crash course of the phase transition theory, and this is all what I wanted to tell today, and we will continue with some uh, fundamental aspects of second order phase transition theory when we discuss um, theory of superconductivity and um, magnetic transitions in uh, local magnets. Any questions? Okay? No questions? Uh, yeah, yeah, I quickly want to want to ask uh, if uh, uh, for example when we did uh, Bose-Einstein condensation you requested the very good uh, ethics book which I uh, was really helpful if, if there is another one you can suggest for, for a lot of uh, uh, this also for phase transition well, for the phase transitions, depending on the level uh, of uh, the theory um, uh, which you would like to digest. There is a brilliant book of John Cardi, which I think is called Phase Transition Theory, and this is also a good introduction to conformal invariance, uh, because um, what we will see discussing phase transition theory, we can introduce correlation length, and uh, everything um, uh, will... Uh, be dependent on the ratio of your distance and correlation length. Correlation length concept is, is very important, so there is very short passage from the phase transition theory 
to the conformal invariance and conformal field theory. So I said that um, there are methods of quantum field theory uh, which is widely used to discuss and to describe space transition. There is another brilliant book of Patashinsky and Pakrovsky, uh, which is called, um, I don't remember, I, I will uh, send you, uh, uh, send me email and I will give you exact title, but it's called like um, quantum field theoretical methods for the phase transition theory, where you can also learn uh, renormalization group, uh, epsilon expansion. Um, uh, by the way, what I forgot to say you here, this is a good point. So I computed this integral, this particular integral, in three-dimensional space. And in three dimension, we see that fluctuational correction um, is divergent as one, as a parallel divergent, one was square root of tau. If you hypothetically consider this integral in four dimensional situation, instead of parallel divergence, you will get a logarithm. If you consider this integral in all dimensions higher than four, you will see that the fluctuational correction is not divergent anymore. It's actually will be proportional to some power of tau. So fluctuational correction will go to zero um, at the transition point. Which means that the four-dimensional situation gives us upper critical dimension for the theory of uh, scalar or the parameter. So physically it means that fluctuations are not important at all for any dimensions higher than four, and for the dimension form, you have a logarithm instead of power law. So this is the concept of um, upper critical dimension, which actually I almost derive you. The whole work compute this integral for four and five dimensional situation and see how the fluctuational correction uh, behave, uh, which then means that Landau theory is perfect uh, for dimensions higher than uh, four. Uh, however, we are living in three dimension and further in two dimensional situation in most cases. Therefore, in principle, you can do some perturbative expansion from the point of view of deviation of your actual dimension from the upper critical dimension. And this is so called epsilon expansion. All these things you can learn from the brilliant book um, of uh, Pakrovsky, but of course, a basic. Um, ideas of phase transition theory you can find in any uh, book of statistical mechanics. My favorite one is Landau Lipschitz, volume 5. Uh, there are several chapters devoted to the phase transition theory. Uh, if you want to begin with, with something, please start with Landau. If you want to learn more and deep, I will give you several uh, suggestions for books uh, to read. There is a question in the chat uh, mm -hmm. by, by Lian. She's asking what you mean by bosonic state is not compact in the previous yes. lecture. Yes. Um, what I said is uh, that um, fermionic Hilbert space, uh, when we are talking about, uh, uh, or it's better to say Fox space, in terms of uh, the occupation number. When you do second quantization, you are working with us in a space of states. In fermionic case, you can have occupation number for given state either zero or one. Which I mean that occupation is limited by one, and therefore it is compact. For bosonic bosonic space statistics, you have occupation of given quantum state which is not limited. You have, can have zero particles in the state, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and so on and so forth. Which means that your Fox space is not compact. You can have arbitrary number of particles occupying a uh, given state. And this is what I am referring to as non-compact Fox space. And the consequence of this compactness and non-compactness is that for bosonic system, your UV transformation or Bogolubov transformation uh, corresponds to rotation on hyperboloid, and hyperboloid, um, the hyperboloid is, so you have uh, this object, 
this object. So this is rotation on a hyperboloid, and for, this is for boson bosons. For fermions, your UV transformation corresponds to rotation on a sphere. And from the point of view of topology, hyperboloid is not compact because it goes like hyperbola uh, to the infinity, and sphere is compact. And this is what I meant um, as compact and non-compact manifolds, which is related to um, the compact or non-compact, well, will relate it to the properties of your Fox space uh, for fermions and bosons. In one case, you have limited Fox space. Uh, in uh, the boson statistic case, you have unlimited Fox space. Okay? More questions? So, if not, how was the tutorial? Tell me. Did it work? Are you still with me? Uh, yes, uh, we are. Yes, the tutorial work we fixed and we had a class. Mm -hmm. I hope Andre had time to discuss with you these thermodynamic uh, relations and thermodynamic inequalities, uh, which is very important and very useful to come from certain class of thermodynamic potential to another class, make a change of variables, write down the equivalent of transformation from um, one potential to another potential and therefore relate some observables like specific heat entropy uh, through these equivalents, equivalents. Okay, if not, Wednesday we will have first lecture on superconductivity and then we proceed with the superconductivity for next four or maybe five lectures. Good. So the lecture is finished. Thank you very much. Yes, but very uh, the sound is very low. <laughs>